This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. I started my conversation with Ron Lieber by reading him a little bit of a press release. Ron writes the Your Money column for The New York Times, and I wanted his take on an announcement from September of 2021. An announcement from J.P. Morgan Chase, the country's biggest bank, saying it was buying a startup called Frank. Frank's business was supposedly built around helping students navigate the financial aid system, and J.P. Morgan Chase wanted in. So much so that they reportedly paid $175 million for Frank. Here's the part I read to Ron. Frank offers a unique opportunity for deeper engagement with students. Together, we'll be able to expand our capabilities for students and their families, helping them financially prepare for college and other major moments in their future. How much do you think J.P. Morgan Chase regrets those words now? Well, think about it this way, Lizzie. They don't regret trying to chase after 20-somethings who might have a half century of financial services customerdom in their future. This is something they very much want to do. But I think they deeply regret not having asked another five to 10 relatively basic questions about the enterprise that they were purchasing and the founder behind it. Because according to J.P. Morgan, Frank was not all it seemed, nor was Charlie Javis, the woman who started it. In fact, J.P. Morgan says pretty much the whole thing was a lie. And now the bank is suing Javis, saying it was the victim of fraud. Listen to J.P. Morgan's CEO, Jamie Dimon, on the bank's recent earnings call. I was just saying in one way or another, it was a huge mistake. Which is like, CEOs never say that. They never say that kind of thing on an earnings call. What did you think when you heard that? You know, I thought it was sort of refreshing, Lizzie, because if you're a venture capitalist, you're getting it wrong, you know, nine times out of 10 or 48 out of 50 or whatever the number is. It stands to reason that if you are making small to medium-sized deals, and let's be clear, to to J.P. Morgan Chase, this was a small to medium-sized deal. If you're making small to medium-sized deals on the regular, you're probably going to get it wrong more than once or twice. And so to me, it was actually sort of refreshing that they stood up in public and said, we screwed this up. Today on the show, how exactly the biggest bank in America screwed this up and whether it got taken by a 20-something startup founder. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. 
Like a lot of financial technology startups, Frank sought to capitalize on young people's inherent comfort with digital tech. And the idea that an online service might make a notoriously complex process, getting financial aid, a little easier. It started with the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. But beyond that, it's honestly tough to figure out how exactly the company's business model was supposed to work. And the big idea at first was to help people who are having trouble filling out the federal financial aid form known as FAFSA, which is notorious for its, you know, hundred odd questions and all sorts of financial detail that you need. And it creates conflict with, you know, divorced parents or absent parents. It creates, you know, troublesome conversations between kids and parents. So they were going to help you fill that out and make it easier. That was the first thing of many things that they were aiming to do and selling people on. But FAFSA is free. I mean, that's literally the first word in there is, is free. Um, so that, that was their service, pay us and we'll make this thing less of a headache? Yeah, but, you know, as we know, uh, out there in the world and even in the world of financial services and banking and technology, it, you can manage your own money, your retirement investments for free, but it might be easier or quicker to hire somebody else to do it for you. Hmm. Now, at first, Frank was not charging most people for this assistance. They had a premium version at the very beginning. It was never clear to me exactly what it was. Um, But, you know, they, like any startup, were throwing a bunch of things at the wall and seeing what sticks. And FAFSA wasn't the only thing that they were trying to help people with. There's 44 million borrowers who are currently in the process of paying back their loans in the United States. At the heart of Frank's sales pitch to investors was Charlie Javis. When she started Frank in 2016, she was just 24. Some of her earlier ventures hadn't worked out, but when she spoke to audiences or venture capitalists, and later J.P. Morgan Chase, she sold a compelling narrative. As a student who filed FAFSA with her parents and had to do it every single year while I was at Penn, It was really something where the experience of filing it was so complicated, and you find out so late what you're supposed to do. Her pitch was, financial aid is broken. It's way too hard. Somebody needs to make it easy on low to moderate income kids and families to get access to money that is rightfully theirs. And because I was a financial aid kid myself, I know how painful this is. And with all of the smarts that I acquired through the scholarships I got at Fancy Fancy Wharton undergrad, um, I'm going to fix this for everybody. And that story resonated with with people, resonated with investors? Uh, It sure did. You know, five, 10 different angel investors and VC firms lined up. And, you know, through multiple rounds, the company uh, raised, it was a low double digit amount of millions of dollars. Why do you think JP Morgan Chase was so interested in this company? Because, you know, $175 million, small amount for them, but it's still not nothing. Um, Why did they want it? Well, if you are the biggest bank in America, and you are trying to figure out where your next generation of customers is going to come from, when that next generation starts engaging in banking behavior in their teens, quite often they're using apps on their phone. And a whole bunch of startups over the last five to 10 years have sort of flooded into market with piles of venture capital money trying to create mobile-first banking experiences. So these are mostly not banks themselves. They're kind of renting a bank charter behind the scenes, but they're offering a a very sort of slick and friendly front end that is appealing to digital natives. J.P. Morgan has mostly sat that out. And what they have realized in the last couple of years is that they need to pay way more attention to what's happening with digital financial services and how teens and people in their 20s are using them so as to capture those customers or move them over eventually, right? So Frank, in theory, was millions of satisfied customers who had an affinity for a brand that helped them get money from college and for college. And there was this founder, Charlie Javis, who was out there in public 
talking a really good game who seemed to be really good at what she did. And that's the kind of young executive that you might want hanging around as a managing director to help you reach that audience that you are having so much trouble reaching at present. So in the words of our colleague, Matt Levine, that they bought an email list, (laughs) but, but also they bought, you know, the, I guess, the sheen around her, around Javis and the kind of like, young, plucky charisma that comes along with that. Yeah, if I'm in that deal room, in that due diligence room, or it's my job as a, you know, 27-year-old investment banking associate uh, at JPM, you know, to sell the bankers on this deal, I'm saying, look, um, they've got 4 million engaged customers. And if they already have an affinity for the brand called Frank... If we buy this company and we cross-sell to them correctly, those customers will be our customers and we'll keep them for 50 years, right? Mm. So $35 per customer is not such an outrageous price to pay. And I think that's how they sold themselves on the worthiness of pursuing this. What J.P. Morgan thought it was buying was a list of somewhere north of 4 million young people. But according to the bank's lawsuit, and all of this is just alleged right now, Javis had nowhere near that number of customers. In fact, J.P. Morgan says most of those millions of people were completely made up. Whatever the figure was, um, J.P. Morgan says that the real number was closer to, I think it was 300,000 or something thereabouts, right? Um, 300,000 people that had in some way, shape, or form actually engaged with the company or used one of its services, I I think was the real number. Um, Or at least that was the number of real emails and real names that they actually had in their database, according to J.P. Morgan. Now, let's remember here that these are all allegations. Allegations, yes. Right. There has been no reply yet. The reply from Charlie Javis is not yet due in court, right? But what J.P. Morgan is saying is that all the rest of the emails and other customer data were either made up from whole cloth or purchased from a third party in attempt to cover up the fact that there were never the millions of names and customers that Frank had promised during the course of getting the deal done and selling itself. How did she do it? Like, where did these 4 million imaginary people come from, or however many there were? So there were a couple of allegations. The first is that there was an unnamed data scientist who Frank worked with on a consulting basis to help them sort of stuff their database with names and other customer data that would, in effect, be believable and pass muster during the due diligence process. So that is the first allegation. The second one is that Frank also went out on the open market to third parties that are in the business of selling leads, of selling names and email addresses of real, live, actual college students. So... What appears to have happened, according to J.P. Morgan, is that Frank, realizing that it was in trouble because it did not have the number of people that it was saying that it had, went out and tried to either invent them or buy real names um, in the hopes that when it did turn the database over to JPM and when J.P. Morgan did try to run its first test, that it would work well enough that nobody would know about all of the shenanigans that took place. That's the allegation. Once J.P. Morgan began investigating, the bank says it found evidence of fraud in Charlie Javis's emails, including one where she tried to reassure a nervous engineer that no one would end up in, quote, an orange jumpsuit over what they were doing. You know, you can go so many different ways with this, right? One way you can go with this is... Well, she must not have been really doing fraud because anybody who's doing fraud isn't going to do it on email, right? Everybody is going to be wise enough not to do fraud on email. 
so, you know, that's one school of thought, you know, the sort of flip side school of thought is, well, there's no need to even have a trial here because JP Morgan caught her red handed. You know, they've got the receipts. Like what, what is the defense to this? Unless, you know, JP Morgan invented all of the emails the same way that it's accusing her of having invented a lot of the names. But of course, why would JP Morgan get up in public and thoroughly embarrass themselves if they weren't a hundred percent sure that you know they had the receipts and could prove um, that what they say happened actually happened, right? So, I mean, how often do you see something like this tossed out into public for all of us to chew on? Let alone by the biggest bank in America, it's really extraordinary. When we come back, shouldn't J.P. Morgan have you know? checked all this out? This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. The moment a business dream becomes reality. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. They simplify selling online and in person and provide 24-7 support so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 22, all lowercase. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. There's a there's a section in the lawsuit where J.P. Morgan says in every aspect of her interactions with JPMC, Javis had a choice between revealing the truth about her startup and accepting Frank's actual value and lying to inflate Frank's value and reaping the rewards from that inflation. Javis chose each time to lie, which, OK, but come on, you're J.P. Morgan Chase. You are, in fact, the biggest bank in the country. Where was there due diligence. Aren't they supposed to check? I don't know what the hell happened. Hindsight is always 2020. Um, I knew enough about financial aid from having written a lot about higher education over the years, the decades really now, to see some of the holes in what, um, you know, Frank was claiming. It was certainly clear that, you know, she had written this op-ed for the New York Times in 2017 that was chock full of errors, right? She, there was a, you know, public spanking from the Federal Trade Commission over some of the services they were offering during the pandemic. You would have thought that that would have given J.P. Morgan some pause. You know, there are numbers that didn't add up. And, you know, my question for J.P. Morgan, which stands because they won't answer the question on the record They wouldn't answer the question in public. My question was, did you have anybody in that due diligence room who was on financial aid themselves and knows how it works, right? And therefore would know what questions to ask or how to put the company through its paces. Was there anybody on the senior team whose own children were applying for financial aid or at least attempting to fill out the FAFSA? Because I'm pretty sure that if you had people on the team who had done those things and were empowered to speak up, there might have been more skepticism of the deal. Even if you look at basic FAFSA numbers, and I'm I'm looking at the 2020 to 21 application cycle, it says 17.8 million FAFSAs were submitted. And Frank is claiming that they had roughly 4 million customers, that seems like a a huge share of the market, like an almost impossible share of the market. Right. So, I mean, let's be as generous as possible here. 17 million people filling out the FAFSA, 1 million uh, using Frank each year. So that's that's a pretty high share. Now, 
for people who haven't spent a lot of time trying to attract new customers on the web, trying to get the attention of 1 million people each year requires billions of impressions using Google AdWords and a whole army of people doing search engine optimization um, so that people can find their way to your site using, you know, sort of content and, and articles as um, as a sort of lure. This is really, really, really expensive. You do not do it with $12 million in venture capital money. Just, you know, thinking about that in terms of the logic of it, you know, the numbers start to not make so much sense, right? The question marks, you know, start rising up from the ground right away. One of Ron's theories about why J.P. Morgan might have missed the red flags has to do with who was likely in the room doing the due diligence in the first place. Well, look, um, my question about the socioeconomic diversity of their due diligence team um, was rooted in the possibility, maybe the likelihood, although, you know, not the certainty, that... Big banks hire mostly but not exclusively from very expensive private institutions where more than 50%, five zero, of the people who attend them are not on financial aid and have never been close to wanting for anything. And the possibility, maybe the likelihood, that the people who are finance and econ majors themselves come from affluent families where the parents work in finance or, you know, related industries. And so if that's how you recruit and your due diligence team just so happens to be made up of people who are never on financial aid themselves, then there is a high likelihood that you will be walking in the door not knowing anything about how the financial aid system works. And if you try to give yourself, you know, sort of a crash course in it as a 28-year-old or as a 48-year-old, you're not going to learn it or feel it the same way as you would if you were 17 trying to work this out with your single parent, if you were first gen, uh, if your parents were undocumented. Um, And without people like that on the team, maybe the questions that you ask are not as incisive. One thing Charlie Javis was not wrong about is that the FAFSA process, and frankly, the entire student aid process, is incredibly complicated. I asked Ron why it's so confusing to begin with. All sorts of well-meaning government bureaucrats over the case of many decades kept adding checks and balances and questions to the form that is the gateway for federal financial aid in a very well-meaning fashion so that nobody would take advantage of the system and get something that they did not deserve. But where the end result after 50 years of this is a form so complicated that it is intimidating even to people who are reasonably financially sophisticated. You know, it's it's tempting to blame everybody who ever touched this thing. It's also tempting to give everybody a break because, you know, most people who have come close to the system are trying to act in the best interest of the U.S. Treasury, right, and precious federal dollars towards aid, and in the best interest of students who um, want to get a degree but don't have enough to pay for it. And so you can see how over decades, many people would add one more thing or one more thing or one more thing to make sure that nobody was getting anything they didn't, and scare quotes here, um, deserve, but then layer on so much complexity that this begins to feel impossible and possibly unfair. It feels extremely American that we are having a conversation about a failed startup built on the back of the federal financial aid process instead of, ah, well, here are some streamlined reforms to the federal financial aid process. 
This is the thing, Lizzie, right? We're always, you know, sort of picking away at the back end or the bad result that, you know, falls out of the complexity that's been built in layer on layer over time so that, you know, only the quote unquote deserving um, get what they're supposed to and the undeserving are barred. And, you know, in, in other countries, there is just an understanding up front that, education, retirement, health care, uh, those are all public goods. And we will pay, you know, six percentage points or eight percentage points more in income taxes each year. And then there won't be any bureaucracy. There won't be anywhere near as much red tape. Stuff will just happen. People will get things. And we won't be having podcasts to talk <laughs> about, you know, people who tried to raise a bunch of money to cut through the red tape and then ended up maybe not telling the truth about what they were doing. <laughs> Do you think Frank's investors saw this as like a, a, a feel-good story, as like a social good that they were, you know, they, they wanted a return, but maybe it was like a warm and fuzzy return? I mean, wouldn't you, right? I, you know, if you can help millions of people, um, you know, sort of achieve the American dream by getting to or, and through college, you know, without as much debt as they might otherwise, you know, you'd want to write a check for that. But here's the thing, right? Um, as Sabrina Manville, who uh, was involved with a, a related startup that, you know, competed with Frank for attention, as she put it to me, right, it's just the thing you have to remember about this business, if you're thinking about it as a business and not as a nonprofit. And by the way, there are all sorts of great nonprofits that help right. people fill out the FAFSA, right? This exists in the world. If you're going to think about this as a business, right? It's like, where is your revenue going to come from? Because the students don't have the money by definition. They're coming to you because they need help getting the money. So the people with the money are the schools that are trying to attract them. And it's financial service companies like J.P. Morgan Chase that would like those newly degreed students to be their customers for the rest of their life, right? So what value does something like Frank have to a school or to J.P. Morgan? It's the data. For her part, Charlie Javis has denied the allegations and turned around and sued J.P. Morgan Chase, saying the bank couldn't work around student privacy laws and committed misconduct. I feel like every story we do, and we have done a lot of them, about a seemingly successful whiz kid and then their fall. Elizabeth Holmes, Sam Bankman-Fried, Charlie Javis. I always wonder why people are taken in. And, and I wonder why you think we as a society and we as the media, because we play a part here too, are so vulnerable to these kinds of stories. I think we're vulnerable because not infrequently people with a two in front of their age who have, you know, started digital companies actually change the world, right? It happens. Hmm. You know, it's fascinating when it does. Um, And there are insights that younger adults bring to business um, that lots of older adults um, don't have or don't act on. And so everybody wants to invest in and read about the next thing that's actually going to work. It's fascinating, right? And, you know, it's it's a story as old as America. Somebody comes along, not always a young person over the years, but more frequently these days, somebody comes along and just has a world-beating idea or they do something something old in an entirely new way. And that's super cool when it works out, right? Um, And so we're always looking for the next thing. And I think we always will be. But you, Ron, have written a number of books about money, particularly money and kids and morality and kind of what, what the ethical way is to think about money. Isn't there some inherent tension in what we know from evidence is kind of the the steady, plodding, and probably ethical way to think about money and the razzle-dazzle that is so seductive. Like, why can't we stop reaching for the shiny thing? You know, the, the easy and pat explanation, Lizzie, is that there is a culture of lying in politics, and lying in politics has actually 
helped people get elected or they've been elected in the very least in spite of their line. And so, you know, there's a lesson to be learned that like everybody should lie everywhere when they're young because like that's how you make it work really fast. Uh, You know, there may be some truth to that. To me, a more interesting explanation is to watch what happened with, you know, companies like Uber and Airbnb, where they knew exactly what regulations and sometimes laws um, that they were going to break in the course of cutting through regulations and outdated laws that maybe did not deserve to exist anymore. And the business model was literally break the rules, wait to get caught, lobby like mad, and after you know a couple of years of fighting, if we lose, and we very well might lose, we'll have a business already and a group of customers and stakeholders so large that we will be a force to be reckoned with. Um, you know, that's the story of Uber in particular, right? And it worked. It works. It works again and again and again. And so if I'm Charlie Javis and I'm starting Frank... I'm definitely going to use the FAFSA trademark, even though I know that I'm not supposed to, because it's the federal government and it'll take them 18 months to catch up with me. And by the time they do, you know, I'll be established. And, you know, once they do catch up with me, they'll slap me on the wrist and no big deal. Right. So, you know, this is the thing that I find so interesting because it works and venture capitalists encourage it. And, You know, it's not particularly ethical, um, but then again, you know, it turned out to be a a, a pretty good way to um, birth a unicorn for, you know, companies like Uber and Airbnb. Ron Lieber, I really appreciate you talking with me and, uh, and your reporting on this. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Lizzie. Ron Lieber writes the Your Money column for The New York Times. He also knows quite a bit about this whole paying for school thing. You should check out his book, The Price You Pay for College. All right, that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Tori Bosch. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of Audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. And we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you are a fan of the show... First of all, I'm grateful. And second, I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we'll be back next week with more episodes. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening.